the Mariners' all-time leader in wins, Jamie Moyer's remarkable career spans decades. Moyer broke into baseball as a wide-eyed bat boy in 1926, then pitched in the Major League's first night game nine years later. In the 1970s, Jamie popularized the big hair look in baseball. Are you kidding me? I embellished a little, just a little. It's going to be great. On the afternoon of July 20th, 1910, a pitcher named Ed Moyer makes his professional debut for the Washington Senators. The play-by-play -play for this game is, for all intents and purposes, lost. But here's what we know. We know that Ed enters the game in relief, following up five innings of three-run ball from starter Bob Groom. We know that Ed faces three batters on this day, Terry Turner, Nap Lejoy, and Harry Bemis. And we know that all three of those batters get base hits off of Ed, causing manager Jimmy McAllen to yank the rookie for Hall of Famer Walter Johnson. At just 145 pounds, Ed Moyer, or as the press calls him, Doc, is not the picture of athleticism. He doesn't have the overpowering stuff that Johnson has, but he does have something else. His teammates call it the wonder, Others simply call it the best spitball they've ever seen. It was the spitter that got Ed signed out of Ohio a month ago, and it's the spitter that he'll ride for the rest of the season. All of five games. Fast forward to spring training the next year. Moyer is pitching a practice game. He throws a spitter to Fred Corbin, who sends it right back up the middle. Due to the ball being covered in the pitcher's spit, it doesn't behave like a normal line drive should. Moyer misjudges it and gets hit in the face. Ed Moyer has been knocked unconscious. He lies on the pitcher's mound, bleeding from his mouth and nose. The ball is bounced so far off of his head that it's rolled over to the first base bag. When Moyer comes to, he tells them he's ready to go on pitching. His teammates insist otherwise. The argument is moot either way, since Ed can't really stand up anymore. He makes a few comeback attempts, but Ed Moyer never sees an MOB field again, as a player. In June of 1916, Dr. Charles Edward Moyer graduates from the American School of Osteopathy. That summer, he becomes the team trainer for the Cleveland Indians. He spends the next 40 years practicing medicine, treating players from Tris Speaker to Hank Greenberg. On November 18, 1962, Doc Moyer dies in Jacksonville, Florida. He is 77 years old. On that same day, 800 miles away, Jamie Moyer is born in Sellersville, Pennsylvania. Jamie and Ed are not related to each other. They will never meet, but the two of them share much more than just a name. Like Ed, Jamie will grow up to be a major league pitcher. Like Ed, Jamie will rely on his off-speed rather than velocity to get batters out. But unlike Ed, Jamie will see more than just a few games in the big leagues. In fact, Jamie Moyer is going to spend a quarter century in professional baseball, becoming one of the most durable players in history. Before we get into it though, please consider subscribing to get more videos like this one. Jamie Moyer grows up in Souderton, Pennsylvania, a town 35 miles outside of Philadelphia. It's no surprise then that Jamie is a Phillies fan as a kid. He watches as ace Steve Carlton sets strikeout records, while perpetual MVP candidate Mike Schmidt mans third. It's in 1980 that things finally come together. Philly beats Kansas City in six games to win their first ever World Series. When the city takes to the streets to celebrate, an 18-year-old Jamie Moyer is out there with them. The Chicago Cubs draft Moyer out of college in 1984. He'd been a dominant pitcher in high school, but had gone undrafted due to low velocity. He went to St. Joseph's University instead and became a bona fide star there. He met Kevin Quirk, a former Yankees draftee who taught Moyer how to throw a changeup. He would employ this pitch heavily over the next three decades. The Cubs sign him on June 7th, and he plays in his first MLB game barely two years later. Looking for the perfect gift for that special Cubs fan? Hi, I'm Mary Ellen, and you can find the answer to all your gift needs in the all-new Chicago Cubs official gift catalog. More than 200 unique gift items are available, including an attractive collection of Cubs t-shirts. They're perfect for those summer days in the park. And don't forget the Cubs bedroom collection, including the Cubs bedspread for your youngster. June 16th, 1986. The Cubs are playing the Phillies at Wrigley Field. It's a day game at Wrigley, just like every game will be for another two seasons. In attendance today are Jamie's parents, Jim and Joan, as well as his college coach, George Bennett. Perhaps of greater note though, to Jamie at least, is the pitcher he'll be starting against. Towing the rubber for Philly today is none other than Steve Carlton, 
Jamie's boyhood idol. Whereas the 23-year-old Moyer is just starting out, however, Carlton is at the end of his rope. Unbeknownst to Steve, he will be released by his club a week from today. This is his second to last game in a Phillies uniform. He is 41. I met with Steve a week ago. He convinced me again that he still wanted to pitch, but I was convinced it was not in the best interest of the Phillies for him to continue pitching for us. What happened? What do you think really happened? A combination of circumstances in which Steve thought he was treated unfairly by some members of the press, plus some incidents involving his personal life. Jamie, in the meantime, shines. It isn't too pretty, taking 8 hits, 117 pitches, and 2 hit batters to get it done. But he lasts 6 and a third innings en route to his first big league win. He lets up 5 runs, 4 earned, against the Mike Schmidt-led Phillies lineup, causing the Chicago Tribune to declare that the best is yet to come. Jamie Meyer, I guess there'll never be a happier day for him than there was yesterday. His parents were here, his uh, high school and college coaches were here, his friends were here. Not only that, but he won. So his cup did overflow it yesterday afternoon. And the Cubs, for their part, skid to a fifth place finish in 86. Moyer puts up solid numbers, but there's not really much to talk about. Besides one small thing. See, through 1987, Jamie Moyer is teammates with one Gary Matthews. At 36, Matthews is a 15-year veteran. He's played nearly 2,000 games, with players like Willie McCovey, Juan Marichal, and Willie Mates. Between the two of them, Moyer and Matthews' careers will span 40 years. Here in 1987, though, Jamie is not having a good time. Over 33 games started, he lets up 28 home runs, posts an ERA plus of 83, and loses 15 games. He allows 114 earned runs, the most in the National League. So what happened? Where did the pitcher from last season go? The answer is the changeup. See, Moyer lost faith in the pitch over time, and became afraid to throw it directly to batters. Instead, he's been nibbling the edges of the zone, getting behind in the count. This forces him to throw fastballs. For someone who tops out in the mid-80s, this isn't ideal. By giving up on his best pitch, Jamie Moyer has basically set himself up to fail. He's able to bounce back in 1988, lowering his ERA to 3.48. Chicago, however, finishes 77-85 and, and sends Moyer to Texas as part of a nine-player trade. Uh, we will you know, keep things quiet so we don't give any political institutions or political folks heartburn, but we will do what's right for the fans. 1990 sees the Rangers begin to lose confidence in Moyer. Of his 33 appearances, only 10 are starts. That November, Texas releases the lefty, just days before his 28th birthday. General Manager Tom Grieve reportedly tells Moyer, we don't see you helping us. The Cardinals take a flyer on him. He starts seven games, going winless in all of them. On the day he's sent down to AAA Louisville, manager Joe Torre tells him, we don't win when you pitch. When he resurfaces in 1993, he's 30 years old. Now in Baltimore, he's fighting for his career. I want to make all the right moves. I want to hit one off the Bromo Tower. I want to tell my neighbor to Blue Jay. Red Sox. Tiger. Yankee. Fan. Practice, practice, practice. I wear my lucky socks, whatever it takes. Within three games, Jamie's ERA shoots up to 574, and it looks like he might be finished. He decides it's time to make a change. In the 1988 film Bull Durham, Susan Sarandon gifts minor league pitcher Nuke Lelouch with a garter belt, which he wears under his uniform to, quote, reorient his head and get him pitching out of the proper hemisphere of his brain. If you haven't seen the movie, watch it, and that'll all make sense. Or maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, one of Moyer's friends, having seen both the film and Jamie's recent struggles, has an idea. It was just one of those things that, you know, he said, all right, you know, I want you to wear this and, you know, it'll bring you good luck. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with this? You know, and I'm thinking, well, how am I going to get this on? And, you know, I didn't want to, you know, I get dressed in the clubhouse with a bunch of guys. I'm thinking, I'm not going to pull a garter out and, and put it on. So I would get myself dressed and I'd put it in my back pocket and go in the bathroom, in the bathroom stall and pull my pants down, put the garter on and then, then pull my pants back up and I'd go pitch with it. But, uh, actually, the first night that I wore it, um, I won a game against the Red Sox 
and uh, I started to wear it religiously uh, after or when I pitched. And my buddy uh, that I grew up with, Scooter Myers, at home, uh, to this day still doesn't believe that I wore it, but uh, I did. Besides his wardrobe, Jamie Moyer's change in fortune can be attributed to a few other factors. The most impactful has been a more aggressive approach towards batters, something Orioles pitching coach Dick Bosman has recommended. The Red Sox offer him $600,000 for the 96 season. He goes 7-1 in Boston, alternating between starter and reliever. The team seems unsure of how to use him, and Jamie grows frustrated with the lack of certainty. The club solves this problem by sending Moyer to Seattle in exchange for Darren Bragg. Darren Bragg will spend two more seasons with the Red Sox. He will then play for the Cardinals, the Rockies, the Mets, the Yankees, the Braves, the Padres, and the Reds, before retiring at the age of 34 and becoming a hitting coach, which he will then follow with a job in Cincinnati's minor league system. Three years after that, Jamie Moyer will still be pitching in the major leagues. Seattle, as it turns out, will be Moyer's home for the next 10 years. Jamie, much like in Evergreen, thrives in the Pacific Northwest. He wins 17 games in 1997, second only to ace Randy Johnson. The Mariners take home the West, but fall short in the division series. Johnson is the clear-cut head of the staff heading into the 98 season, but when the M's go 8-20 in the month of June, things start to turn ugly. The front office, in the midst of a contract dispute with their ace, trade the Cy Young winner to Houston at the deadline. With Johnson now an Astro, Moyer slots into place as Seattle's top pitcher. It's unexpected, but he takes on the role with gusto, finishing with a 3.53 ERA in 234 innings. He's fifth in the league in war, but it's still not enough to save the foundering Mariners. 1999 is a carbon copy for both Moyer and the M's. The lefty puts up solid numbers over 228 innings, while the team wins just 79 games. The one other event from this season that I want to note happens in Seattle on June 4th. It doesn't have to do with Jamie Moyer directly. Moyer doesn't actually appear in this game. Who does, though, is Gary Matthews Jr., the son of Moyer's former teammate. Like his father, Matthews Jr. will spend over a decade as a big league outfielder before retiring in his mid-30s. The 2000 regular season is a step back for Moyer, who sees his ERA climb to 5.49. Nonetheless, he's still scheduled to start Game 4 of the ALDS against the Chicago White Sox. As it turns out though, the club won't need him just yet, sweeping the Sox in three games. With a few days to rest before the championship series, Moyer takes part in a simulated game. He throws a pitch to Chris Widger, who sends it right back up the middle. It hits Moyer in the kneecap. He's knocked out of the postseason with a hairline fracture. The Mariners are taken out by the Yankees 10 days later. At 38 years old, an age when most players start to consider retirement, Jamie Moyer returns from his injury in full force. He leads the staff with 20 wins, his highest total to date. The Mariners, meanwhile, set the American League win record with 116. Moyer makes his first playoff appearance since 1997, winning both of his starts in a hard-fought ALDS against Cleveland. He gets the start in Game 3 of the ALCS in New York, a 14-3 landslide for Seattle. It's the Mariners' lone victory in the series. In the end, Seattle's quest for their first World Series title comes up short. The team never reaches the playoffs again during Moyer's tenure. He goes 21-7 in 2003, and makes his first and only All-Star appearance at the age of 40, becoming the oldest person ever to play in their first Midsummer Classic. In the six years spanning 1998 to 2003, Jamie Moyer is 10th in war among starters. From age 33 to 42, he goes 146 and 76, with an ERA plus of 113. And as his totals rise, so too does his celebrity status. 99. 99. 99 miles an hour? Not miles, kilometers. Jamie got this thing from France. He seems to like it. Ooh la la! Rant? By August 2006, however, things in Seattle aren't very bright. Moyer is so dejected after one game that he calls his wife Karen to tell her he's going to retire when the season's over. She tells him to sleep on it. The next day, Jamie is called into the front office. Philadelphia wants him for the rotation, but he has to waive his no trade clause first. Five days later, Jamie Moyer is in Chicago, wearing a Phillies uniform. Ladies and gentlemen, Jamie Moyer and his first ever bobblehead. He's throwing a fastball. That's unusual. It's a good likeness, don't you think? Yeah, it is. Very good likeness. Can you 
believe you've gone your entire career without a bobblehead. Uh, yeah, I can. 2007 is a new start for the fresh-faced 44-year-old. He anchors a solid Phillies rotation, leading the staff in innings pitched. He's second in wins to a 23-year-old Cole Hamels. The Phillies enter 2008 as the underdogs in the NL East. Thanks to their newly acquired ace, Johan Santana, the Mets are largely considered the favorites, which makes it all the more surprising come October when Philly ends up atop the standings. Moyer's postseason doesn't start too hot, but the team is able to pull out both the division and the championship series. After 22 years as a big league pitcher, Jamie Moyer is finally going to the World Series. The night before his scheduled start in Game 3, Jamie can't go to sleep. He can't even go to bed. He can't go anywhere, really. Because at the present moment, Jamie Moyer is stuck in his bathroom. Um, going. Moyer has come down with a severe stomach virus, less than 24 hours before the third game of the World Series. He sweats through two pillows, a pair of sheets, and a comforter. And yet, when game time comes, it's Moyer who takes the mound. He gives Philly six and a third quality innings, leaving the game with the lead. After Philadelphia secures the win, Jamie's son insists that their toilet seat be donated to the Hall of Fame. As far as I know, that does not happen, but the Phillies do win the series in five. It might have taken them 28 years, but Jamie Moyer and the Phillies can finally celebrate another World Series win together. Against the wishes of the grounds crew, Jamie Moyer digs up the pitcher's mound of Citizens Bank Park. He takes it home and places it on his mantle. On June 15, 2010, Gary Matthews Jr. is released by the Mets. The next day, a 47-year-old Jamie Moyer goes eight innings against the New York Yankees. It's his 265th career win. While the Phillies never quite reach the high of 2008 again, Jamie Moyer stays sharp as a back-of-the-rotation arm. He becomes the oldest pitcher ever to throw a shutout at age 47. Armed with an 80 mile per hour heater, quote unquote, he gives Philadelphia 270 innings between 2009 and 2010. 2010, by the way, is the year the Phillies introduced powder blue uniforms for Turn Back the Clock Day, the very same uniforms that were worn by the Phillies on the day Moyer made his debut. An arm injury causes Moyer to miss the 2010 postseason, and things only get worse in the fall. He goes to the Dominican Republic in an attempt to rehab his injury. Instead, he tears both his UCL and flexor muscle. An injury like this can be devastating for a young pitcher. For a 47-year-old, coming back is without precedent. He undergoes Tommy John surgery, a procedure named for a pitcher who was still in the league when he debuted. At the age of 49, Moyer attends training camp for the Rockies, a team that didn't exist when he started playing. When Colorado hosts the Padres on April 17th, he gets the nod. Seven innings later, Moyer exits to a standing ovation from the home crowd. This game makes him the oldest pitcher ever to record a win. In a full circle moment, the pitcher who relieves Jamie Moyer in his last game is Josh Renneke, nephew of Ron Renneke, the first batter Moyer ever faced. Over 27 years, Jamie Moyer played 25 seasons in Major League Baseball. At the time of his retirement, he had faced nearly 9% of all MLB hitters, ever. He also led up a whopping 522 home runs in his career. That's the MLB record. It's also not surprising, given that he logged over 4,000 innings over that quarter century. Interestingly, he's the only one of the top five in homers allowed not to be in the Hall of Fame. See, there was actually a time not that long ago when Moyer's career numbers could have gotten him into the Hall. His cumulative totals rival those of Jack Morris and Jim Cott, both of whom have earned the call in recent years. As things stand though, Moyer has more of a reputation as a compiler, someone who pads his stats by hanging on long past his prime. And sure, you can argue that a pitcher who plays to the age of 49 certainly fits that description. But still, there are plenty of pitchers who top out in the mid-80s, and most of them don't make it past high school. I don't think that Jamie Moyer is a Hall of Famer. You can let me know where you think he lands in the comments. But Moyer was a pitcher who could be counted on every five days to provide his team with six quality innings. And that's a pretty valuable thing, even if the numbers might not show it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.